In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Miles Neal, Buddhist psychotherapist and author of the book Gradual Awakening. When Dr. Neal contacted me, offering to appear on the podcast, I was intrigued by his impressive list of mentors, including Columbia University's Professor Robert Thurman and Geshe Tenzin Zopa. In this interview, Miles recounts how an affluent but disturbed childhood with alcoholic parents and a narcissistic father drove him to self-harm and dissatisfaction, and how he found solace and healing in religious practice and a series of influential mentors. Miles tells a remarkable story of a supernatural experience with a reincarnated child master, a tulku. Miles goes on to address the conflicts between the views of his Western therapeutic training, which prizes healthy parental attachment, and his religious affiliation with Tibetan Buddhism, in which specially chosen boys are removed from their homes as young as three years old, undergoing rigorous training to become avatars of their lineage. Miles discusses the cultural and religious context of this practice and the possible developmental impacts on the young boys. Miles reveals the secrets of being a good mentee, discusses the ups and downs of his relationships with his mentors, and candidly discusses his own path as a practicing Buddhist and professional therapist. So without further ado, Dr. Miles Neal. Dr. Miles Neal, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. I have been, as I said, enjoying your podcast series immensely and all the amazing guest speakers that you've had on there. I've enjoyed it. Uh, during my morning runs, that's when I, I listen mostly to the podcast and it's been yours on my, on cue very recently. So so thanks for all the work that you're doing, all the, all the good work and uh, a very deep, an insightful podcast that you run. So, so congratulations to you. Thank you, Miles. So your early life was very interesting. You write in your book, Gradual Awakening. I grew up in an affluent family. We had it all. My father was a successful businessman and my mother an interior designer. My brother and I were educated in the best schools. I did exactly what everybody in our culture expected. Got a degree, went for the advanced degree, pursued a profession, got married. Yet from the time I was 16, I felt an underlying discontent. It didn't take me long to figure out that no matter how much money we accumulated, how many vacations we took, all the nice stuff we had, it wasn't enough. More wasn't better. Something was missing. And you've also said that your father was a narcissist. I'm sure as a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist, you use that term quite precisely. And your parents had substance abuse uh, issues with alcohol. And in fact, you were engaged in self-harm behavior, burning cigarettes on your body and so on at that time you're describing there. You say, I endured humiliation for decades under my dad's tyrannical authority. And because of the dependency I had on him, I couldn't rise up and challenge him. And so I felt humiliated and stuck. So can you describe your situation growing up? Well, I think you just did it. I can't believe that I've actually put that out there that thoroughly in public. <laughs> but in a way, I guess, uh, if you're going to be a public figure, you're going to talk about these things that we're talking about to have uh, some honesty and some transparency about where one is coming from. So as to not uh, deceive people into thinking that everything is sort of, you know, blissful and, uh, or that we're special. You know, I can't imagine people that have been around Dharma and have found their way into the Dharma aren't uh, don't relate to the to the to the stories of real people who who have experienced tremendous amount of suffering. And that's what drives or uh, attracts most of us to these kinds of studies. And and so I guess it's no different for me. Why should it be? Uh, that's my story. Uh, you know, my father. Narcissism is really usually characterized by high amounts of self-involvement. Uh, someone who is very preoccupied and uh, and in a way very grandiose about one, themselves, and I, I liken it to a a theater of one in which there's one spotlight and and all the attention is on that one person. And 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 my dad was very charismatic and very capable, and so people really loved him. And uh, and if you followed his mandate, you were rewarded. I mean, he was somebody who was very, very generous, uh, but could pull the cord at any moment. And his tactic of retribution was to humiliate you and to remind you who is the boss. And so he, in a way he was both a king to the world, but a gangster uh, on, uh, behind closed doors. And so I felt very threatened by him most of my life. 
and and you know, as a result of that kind of very very you know imbalanced power dynamic I've, I've have felt a lot of shame most of my life inferiority complex and insignificance uh worthlessness uh incapability those have been the the main threads of my private life i would say and in a way most of my uh, early years uh, they 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 resulted in a great uh, experience of incapacity, uh, being incapacitated and not, not really being capable of moving forward in the world, not being able to embrace things fully, not being able to be out, not, not being able to be vibrant and authentic, but, but really, but really hiding behind a very, um, the veil of subservience and being very nice to people and being very uh, apologetic to people and being very accommodating of people and tiptoeing around people, not wanting to create any conflict. And then of course, you know, by the time you reach spiritual teachings, uh, those are all sort of outward demonstrations of your, you know, your sensitivity and your altruism. And so there, I think it becomes extremely dangerous that the guise of being a compassionate Dharma practitioner, yoga practitioner, service, service oriented someone, can be a hiding place for these uh, unrooted uh, experiences of deep shame and fear and terror. They can just be hiding places for those kinds of things. So I think I probably articulated that backstory wherever it is that you found it in Gradual Awakening, it just as a, as a way of, uh, because my audience are spiritually minded people, uh, to alert them to the dangers of over uh, of uh, pursuing transcendence, uh, but really to locate spiritual life where the ground is wounded uh, and in the bedrock of one's wounds, uh, if that be childhood or family or culture or race, uh, that's the real arena around which healing can 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 really happen. And so I've never been a strong advocate for transcendence. I have been someone who front and center has revealed my wounds and been very transparent about my growth. And I'm, I don't claim enlightenment. I don't purport to be a guru. Uh, I'm really just working on myself using these very rich traditions. That's very interesting. It seems a major theme in your approach. Uh, this, um, if you want, integration of the trauma perspective and the psychological perspective you've written that people find their way to spiritual communities because they're wounded that's a direct quote and i know you work as a therapist so i'm curious you know what are the typical consequences of growing up in an environment like that with substance abuse and your father having narcissistic personality disorder for instance that uh, charisma is a classic that's sort of uh, a classic trait of the of, of the narcissist uh, not all charismatic people are narcissists, but many narcissists are very charismatic. Um, aware true. it's often said that children with parents of substance abuse problems can become very hypersensitive to others' moods, anticipating the, the, the sudden change, snap change of mood and the danger that can bring. And I'm also aware that um, children of narcissists uh, can often themselves become quite narcissistic in an attempt to sort of get that attention, that recognition um, that was that is of course absent uh, with with a parental figure like that. So I'm curious to what extent your own experience matches up with the typical profile of someone coming from that background, and uh, how how did you began to go about addressing it? Yeah, well, there there is um, a very interesting concept or notion called co narcissism, which is a sort of byproduct or uh, development from a more common uh, term called uh, codependency. Now the codependent is usually the child or the spouse of a, someone who's dependent on drugs, substances, alcohol. So the dependent person is the addict and the codependent is the caretaker of the addict who feels they are afraid for their life. They are afraid for the well-being of their loved one. They make excuses and accommodate the addiction because of fear of reprisal or, uh, or threat or danger or all three. And so in a way, while the addict is addicted or dependent on the substance, the, the codependent is addicted to the, to the sort of love relationship that's cross-contaminated by this uh, substance abuse. So they, they become a sort of 
they they learn to take on the role of the provider and caregiver and and sort of assume that that's their rightful place that's where their meaning is derived but it is such an unhealthy relationship dynamic that goes only one way and so it one gets caught in this one way highway where they're delivering all the attention and all the nutrients and and really in a way feeling enormously starved for attention now the the, the same can happen with narcissism. The narcissist is the one that is self-involved. The narcissist lacks empathy. They can be very diabolical when, when they are challenged or threatened. Um, but the co-narcissist is the accommodator. And the one that's too willing to give up, uh, is so willing to give up the limelight and to give up attention and, and, and then learns very intuitively that they don't deserve any attention. And that their role is to be a, an accommodator. And so they learn to be a very good Robin to everyone's Batman, if you will. And they play second fiddle and they, uh, but, but over time when you can't, you don't really learn how to get your needs met. You learn very well how to take care of everybody else's needs but you start to see your needs as secondary, tertiary, or not even, not even worthy of being fed and reciprocated. And so you have a lot of bad boundaries. You have a lot of confusions about what you feel and how worthy you are and what your needs should be and how should you go about them being met. And you develop a lot of strategies to take care of everybody else, hoping one day that will be re reciprocated in some you know, some, somebody's end game, but in, you know, most of us feel after decades of this kind of syndrome uh, that we're underfed, starved, malnourished, exhausted, and helpless. And that's basically, if anyone wanted to look into the symptom of the result of being co-narcissist, that's a bit of a caricature of where you might find yourself. Um, and so I, you know, it's not my, it's not my experience personally, nor in my work treating others that the, 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 the children of narcissists in a way become themselves narcissists. Usually it's this kind of co-narcissist where they're, they're very, damage is too strong a word, it's too finite and too final for me, but wounded, severely wounded and unfed and in a way underdeveloped like a, you know, uh, like a turkey on Thanksgiving that's not done yet. It's like development, a healthy development hasn't fully completed itself. And so it's very hard to manage an adult life when something inside of you hasn't get, been given the appropriate time to really fully mature. You're stunted. Our growth has been stunted. And so it's hard to navigate the world. In terms of like how that has translated and what, you know, I think the if we use this analogy of a stunted growth because of this overbearing father figure who both had these narcissistic traits, but also had the alcoholic syndrome. And you're absolutely right the way you characterized it. Like my nervous system is what's called uh, hypervigilant, which means I'm very, very cued in, a very sensitive radar scanner of other people's emotionality and needs uh, in order to defend and protect myself from the volatility that could happen at any moment given the, 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 the uh, uh, the circumstance of alcohol and, and what that might lead to, I, I had to, I, I had to be hyper alert and aware of who, who was in the room. How could I disarm them? How could I please them? How could I get them their needs so that no, so nothing erupted into a, an absolute chaotic shambolics. Uh, so <clears throat> that's part of my, uh, wiring, you could say, and that's part of people who have survived these kinds of syndromes, that's part of their wiring. Now that that could be turned into an asset, but it, it needs to, it needs to be understood, and it needs to be worked with or tempered. Uh, but it can, it can be very useful. Uh, it's like a second sense, it's like a sixth sense. Uh, but it has been wired with the outward orientation of other people for the specific purpose of defense, protection, self-protection. And so one never feels at ease in, in the world. One is always thinking about worst case scenario and diffusing them, making sacrifices to diffuse them and to, to, to maintain safety. So as we know from the 
current neuroscience on the vagal nervous system, I mean, we are often living in fight or flight or even worse paralysis as a result of that kind of hypervigilance. These are the classic symptoms of trauma, by the way. So, you know, one of the things that has been so helpful in my education and in, and in my healing was to find a suitable proto-parent in which to feel safe again. And this came in many forms across my education and my spiritual path. I, I seem to have very early on found a very, uh, a string of mentors, you, if you will, who provided the sustenance, warmth, safety, and attunement, the kind of raw ingredients that one really needs uh, to develop, to, to sort of mature. Uh, and it's almost like, you know, a young teen, I was very, very, as I wrote in the book, you know, cutting and isolating and basically mostly on my own and very intro introverted. And uh, I happened to find some really great mentors in high school that introduced me to Buddhism and psychology, transpersonal psychology, actually. And more than what they were teaching me as subject matter, it was their, the intangibles of their human presence and attention on me and care and unconditional positive regard and uh, sense of safety and sense of reassurance and sense of validation and healthy attunement. These things were critical. I mean, I, who knows what might have happened had I not found those uh, mentor figures. And I just, I don't, whatever you call a past life merit or, or whatever, I just continually found people like that along my journey. When I went to college, I found a mentor who was a, a Zen psychologist, uh, Professor Sprosty, I'll never forget him. He was a wild, crazy wisdom type figure in, in, at my early years in Wheaton College. And he would take me out to his house in Duxbury, Massachusetts, and it would just be the two of us. And we would talk Buddhism and psychology and their integration. But again, more than what he was teaching me was his interest. It's like, I'm looking at your face right now, Steve, and I'm looking at your surroundings. And, and I could get very interested in you as a human being, like, why are you on this boat in the UK? And, and where did you come from? And how did you get interested in this subject, these very intricate, unique subject matters? And, and as I'm talking to you, and as I'm listening to you, I'm looking at your facial structure, and I'm taking in your energy, and I feel myself being drawn in to know more about your story. And as I meet your story and I'm allowing myself to share my story, there's something intangible happening in us, in, in between us, that makes, that is signaled to each of our brain that the other is safe and that human connection actually feels good, transcendent of any of the terminology and words that are being used. We would call this in just normal parlance, good energy. It just feels good to be with another person to be seen, to be understood, to have some shared commonality and to let that defense structure just dissolve, even if it's just for an hour. And what, that, what happens when that defense structure uh, dissolves and you go from low vagal tone and fight flight reactivity into high vagal um, you know, proximity and vocal intonation and facial recognition are all signaling that you're safe and that now you can connect and when you get into that connection, it's almost like arrested development gets thawed and released so that it can make the onward journey of maturation. It's like uh, trauma interrupts development. It freezes development. Actually, it freezes the nervous system. Now, that's why people who um, use substances and alcohol they tend to get frozen during the age period where they started drinking or using. So they may be drinking for 20 years, but emotionally they're about as old as a 15 year old when they were first molested, for example. And the defense structure of drinking has detached or removed them from all the tumult, the tumult of their emotional experience. And what substance treatment and rehabilitation has done is given access to the nervous system so it can unfreeze. But the precursors, the necessary requirements for successful treatment have to be these sense of safety and proximity seeking behaviors and sense of attunement 
and another nurturing human being. And in AA, that's a wonderful thing because it's not reliance on one figure. In AA and in, in, in Narcotics Anonymous, these programs, what it is is the surrogate parent gets replaced with a, a group space of mutually interested parties and peers. And in therapy, that surrogate parent gets replaced by the therapist who on a weekly dose increment offers unconditional positive regard, attunement, presence, flexibility, validation, reassurance. And in the spiritual world, at least in the Tibetan approach that we both are familiar with, that gets sort of uh, adopted with the, not only the guru, but the preceptors, those people that are in, get, you know, sort of in charge or with your retreat. Um, and also your Sangha members, like you make new families and you take on new parents to, to create the, the sufficient context of safety that allow, would allow you to regress, drop your defense, open your heart again, become vulnerable, thaw the defense structure, and allow yourself the possibility of moving forward in your life because it, uh, wounding and trauma is a, really a breach in trust. It's where we are, we are, we are mostly people who, who, for whom trust has been broken. And in order to protect ourselves from the severe pain of that broken trust, betrayal, abuse, neglect, whatever it might be, we have embraced a world of defensiveness. Uh, we have constructed walls that keep us safe, but then they also never let the pipeline of nutrients to come in. So we're all like kind of withered raisins behind defensive walls. That's what a kind of caricature of life is. It's like raisined, wrinkled little golems behind a wall. Protected, yes but like withering away. And what therapy, spiritual life, spiritual practice can do, not always, sometimes it re-ruptures it, obviously in the case of Sogyal and other of these you know, Tibetan scandals, for example, what it can do is allow someone to stay, start to take the bricks out of the wall and become vulnerable again, so that the pipeline of nutrients of presence and attunement and love can come back in and flush the nervous system and the psyche with, with the with the growth with the growth uh, hormone that it needs to to develop. Uh, so I'll leave it there just to get some of your comment. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very um, clear summary of your overall uh, overall approach. It has that, uh, of course, Tibetan Buddhist plus the Western psychological blend. Very interesting indeed. I'm curious what you. You know, you're talking about um, trauma, and in the case of childhood trauma, uh, in your case, sometimes those uh, imprints are quite deep. You have had some a string of wonderful mentors, and I'd actually like to discuss them in, individually. They're very fascinating. You write about them in your book, in, in with a lot of um, gratitude, actually. So I'd like to discuss them. But in general, how is it do you think you are able to receive that uh, reparenting? when the wounding that you were working with was uh, so, so inflicted so early in your life. Uh, often people, we hear people saying things like, well, one doesn't have the receptors, you know, uh, one's always craving <laughs> that father who will pay attention, but unable when that figure, when, when a person is perhaps filling that need, unable to receive it, doesn't feel right, doesn't feel natural, doesn't feel like home because home mm -hmm. has been, has been uh, imprinted in, in this dysfunctional way very early on. So I'm, I'm curious, um, and because you're a therapist, uh, curious about your, your insight on that, how was it that you were able to uh, receive that reparenting, considering your background? Yeah, I mean, I, you'll, you'll appreciate this because I won't give the classic Western neuroscientific response to it, I think. One way of understanding it is we have Buddha nature. I guess the neuroscience would be that we're very plastic. 
And even if there is an incredibly severe and deep-seated trauma, nothing is permanent or fixed. And so, you know, as social creatures from evolution and as mind Samchen owners, uh, possessors of mind from the Buddhist point of view uh, that transmit or transmigrate through infinite life, we are never separated from the possibility of being in relationship and being in proximity and receiving those nutrients. They get compromised, the ability to absorb them. Like for example, I'm almost 45 now, and it's still hard for me to receive a bloody compliment. And if you look at the reason why is because the the expectation and underneath the expectation that the expectation that anyone would want to compliment me has been uh, damaged because of the habitual nature in which I receive criticism. But also what's been damaged is the sense of worth or what the Buddhist might call dignity. I know Pachak Rinpoche, Pachak Rinpoche really likes to, to talk about dignity in uh, in his talks, and I really like that word. I mean, I think we're severely lacking it in Western culture because of so many constraints and impositions and challenges of child rearing in a Western modern urbanized world where not only one parent is absent, but both parents are absent trying to make a living and we live in isolated contexts. And so there's not really any, there's not enough presence. And so what that does is it, diminishes the possibility for us to feel like we are worth the attention that we deserve or need it. And so even at 45, almost 45, it's hard to get a compliment uh, because the sense of self-worth is so small. Um, on the other hand, through practice and through training, it's like bringing attention to those synapses to grow new neural pathways. Uh, that's the neuroscience of it. And from the Buddhist perspective, it's like we have these latent potentialities. I mean, from a pop cultural view of Buddha nature, it's like you're already a Buddha. You just have to dust it off. I don't, I don't, I think that that's too gross a misunderstanding. I think we have these potentialities that need to be cultivated. Um, and even if they're severely obstructed by afflictions and karma, nevertheless, they're still accessible. And with, with repeated cultivation, they can be pruned and, and developed. Uh, the, the negative pathways could be pruned and the positive ones could be developed. And that in fact is what the word Buddha means, Sangha means to cultivate and to diminish. And I think the neuroscience shows that, that the brain is a plastic thing and that the neural pathways that are interrupted as a result of trauma and the neural pathways that are part of this defense hypervigilance structure get pruned and those that are, you know, those that would lead to a better sense of sense of self worth and dignity would be cultivated. And it, but yet it's a long it's a long haul, and so people have to sort of be committed to the long haul and be very modest uh, modest with their expectations. Hmm. Yes, and in your book Gradual Awakening, which presents the Lam Rim, the path of awakening from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition you draw on the work of your mentor, Joe Loizzo, uh, talking about certain guru yoga or refuge uh, visualization practices, almost pre performing a kind of mental reparenting re process. I find that very interesting. And it also reminded me of Daniel P. Brown's uh, ideal parent work. Mm -hmm. And he himself, of course, deeply involved in, in Tibetan Buddhism and, and Bern, uh, in Togchen Bern in particular. So I find, mm -hmm. that, I find that very, very interesting. Something you mentioned there about the lack of presence of parents in the home and so on. I'm curious, it just occurred to me, what your take is as, you know, as a therapist uh, on, on the cultural practice of uh, removing a tulku, a reincarnated master, uh, uh, removing a tulku from the home at a very young age, two, three, four, five, something like that, putting them into uh, a monastic uh, context uh, was very, very rigorous and training. We hear, of course, there are, there are many accounts from Tulkus of their training. 
uh, the old style, certainly. Very rigorous, often allowed no playmates, allowed no toys, rigorous study, no access to their parents and so on. Quite an interesting effect developmentally that that might have. And even mm. today, there are, I think today the pressures on Tugas are slightly different, more to do with being, you know, immediately revered public figures and so on, less, less perhaps separation from the, from the family. I don't think they do that quite as much as they used to. But mm. what's, your, uh, what's your take on that in terms of its developmental consequences? Yeah, well, well, let me put it into a particular context, my response, because I, my, my, my personal teacher, Geshe Tenzin Zopa, is, uh, he's about, a, he's, a 40, he's my age, he's a 45-year-old Nepali monk, he currently lives in Australia, but he, he was a few years back featured in a documentary called Unmistaken Child, have you seen that? Yeah, it's a great documentary, very interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful documentary, and I encourage anyone who hasn't seen it to see it because it's just, it's so profound, uh, an example of devotion. But nevertheless, the story plot goes that uh, his master, when he was, uh, his master, Geshe Lama Konchog, was one of the great Mahasiddhas, you know, living Mahasiddhas of the 20th first century, one of these kind of cave dwelling hermit yogis. Who accomplished the rainbow body and 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 has a whole you know um, all the signs were evident in his case of his great mastery. Although he uh, would have never professed any such thing, he was admired and revered in, in the Sum Valley as being a great saint. And then asked you know to come to Kopan Monastery and lived out the remaining years as a as a teacher there and as a mentor uh, to Geshe Tenzin Zopa. And when he died, the, the story really, uh, you know, traverses or follows Geshe Tenzin Zopa on his quest to find his, uh, his deceased Lama, uh, the reincarnation of his deceased master, which is, I mean, there's so, it's such a hero's journey, isn't it? It's such a profound thing, but it, it's heartwarming because it really does reveal the humanity of Geshe Tenzin Zopa, how lost and despairing he was, but also his it will bring tears to my eyes because I've seen and spent so much time with him. I know his noble heart, how, how sensitive a human being he is and uh, his great faith and devotion. But, and I met uh, the Tulku. I met the Tulku when I was at Kopan Monastery doing my studies in 2006. And I used to sneak out from classes and lectures to go down the hill to meet the little Tulku. And there I would see him, I would read to him, I would play with him. And uh, there is a, an unbelievable story about him. Uh, maybe it will be a, a little bit of a digression, but would you like to hear this story? It's involving you. It involves me and this little tulku, but then remind me to come back to answer your question on what right. do I think about the tradition. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm basically hanging out with Geshe Tenzin Zopa and this little tulku, and uh, he's probably not more than five or six years old. And uh, I'm cutting class to do it because it's during class time at the monastery. And I do it over a number of period days. I, I make my way with my coffee down the steps and find, find, find time, just the three of us, and sometimes just the two of us playing. And a uh, very sweet boy, you know, very, you know, just like any other child, really. Uh, and then one day I go down there as I had been for the last few days and he is in a temper sneer, very volatile, very wrathful, telling me, go home, you go home, you go home, like that insistent and just like really unsettled me. Like I, I didn't know what I had done or what I had did. And there's me little Miles with my trauma history going, now this little child is scolding me and telling me to go home and what have I done? And so I, because I was cutting class, I couldn't go back to the seminar. So I went to my room and there on my bed, I have found a little note from the administrative office saying, please call your family. They just called the monastery. And so it was back in the days where there was no uh, cell phone. So I had to go find a pay phone. And, I, and at the time my parents were living in Turkey and I finally got through to them over the time difference. And my mom was on the phone crying saying, you're, you've got to come home. Your dad has cancer, it's pancreatic cancer and he's not going to make it. And, uh, and I put two, two together uh, that this, this little child, this little Tulku at four or five or six had the kind of clairvoyance or, or um, city. And it was only decades later that I told Geshe Tenzin Zopa about that story because he never, he never observed the full, the full uh, chapter, narrative of that chapter. And, uh, and he said, oh yeah, you know, I, I, yours isn't the only story that I heard just like that. He, he was a very special kid. Mm -hmm. And that he had these kinds of breakthroughs 
And the fact that he was so animated and you could almost tell now in retrospect that it was almost like a, not a possession, but it was almost like another character inside of him. Something with much more clarity and much more uh, ability to cut through. And um, anyway, so that's a little story about the power of this tulku, right? And, and the lineage of the transmission of these great siddhas and mahasiddhas. Mm-hmm. But to answer your, your, it does sort of beg the question, you know, um, what's it like for a child to be removed in the story of the unmistaken child once the little child was um, given the, the traditional tests by Geshe Tenzin's open which he lays out the array of rosaries and the array of uh, bells and door jays and the child is supposed to pick the right bell owned by the predecessor and of course he does that perfectly with all the different ma then starts the process of extraction. They have to take this child and have to seek permission from the family. Okay, and so from a Western clinical point of view, you're going to be very concerned about a child being removed from a family. But we have to understand that in Tibetan culture, they, they are predominated by a whole ethos. And we cannot look at that tradition simply clinically from our own vantage point without having a sensitivity of understanding it endemically from its own vantage point. In other words, it would just be like an anthropologist being dropped in the tribal uh, Serengeti or in with the Aboriginals in Australia without and understanding their rituals without first asking them the question about their own mythology and their own cosmology and their own culture. You have to understand these things from within. And so on the one hand in the documentary, you see the mother crying uh, because what mother could ever let go of her child? That is the universal human condition of like separation from the most beloved is met with utter despair. And yet, they are both willing to do it. There's no, nobody's pointing a gun to them, their heads to let go of this child. Why do they do it? Why do they release the child to the, uh, to the mentorship of Geshe Tenzin Zopa to bring back to the monastery to start a, a, a monastic life? Is because they understand the transmigration of the soul and they understand the significance of who that child really is. They understand that that child could be a mere farmer in a small village in the Sum Valley or a great living master for an entire community or the planet or the globe could be a living Buddha and benefit many living beings. And so in one hand is the despair of losing your personal uh, child. And in the other hand is the great boon from the heart of devotion that understands the gift that you're giving to humanity. By letting go of this child, you give a gift to so many others. This child's role, occupation, is is of a Buddha's compassionate service to infinite beings. And we would never really understand that as clinical psychologists unless you understood the worldview of the Tibetan infinite life possibility and the meaning of this tradition of tulkus and and what the whole purpose of life really is. I mean, if the, if you take a materialistic reductionistic point of view, you think, okay, well, this child should stay with their nuclear family and should live out their days going to get educated or, or serving a function for the immediate family and till the soil and harvest the crop and, 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 and help support the family in their elder years and, and pro- procreate and let the whole wheel spin into a next generation. But from an infinite life Tibetan cosmology, this is a great soul. This is an evolved soul on the quest of being a Buddha that has incarnated for the specific purpose motivated by altruism, bodhicitta, to serve out its function in a life form to help assist other living beings in their maturation process and their spiritual evolution. And so, it's so much bigger than one family letting go of a child. It's like if you knew your child was Christ. 
would you let them go to the temple? Would you let them go to the desert? You know, would you let them fill out their dharma? Um, and so the other thing is, is it's not like this child or in the case of the Dalai Lamas, for example, because the Dalai Lama was also given up by his immediate family of present 14th Dalai Lama. Uh, but in a way there, they, the, the reason that it mostly works from my point of view, uh, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing or minimizing the, the impact of the loss, uh, but it mostly works because they don't, they inherit another set of loving parents. So it would, it's like an adoption. It's more like adoption. You know, if you go, if you're adopted by a family who doesn't care about you, that is a very tragic story. That child doesn't do so well if you go into foster care and get, you get, you get, you get three square meals, but you don't get any love or you get abused by your adopted parents those people end up getting addicted and incarcerated much at higher levels of preponderance of uh... But in the case of Geshe Lama Konchok, uh, who then became uh, Tulku Ponsok, he inherited Geshe Tenzin Zopa, who's one of the most exquisitely available proto-parent figures that anyone could ever want. And not only that, but it's not just one parent taking care of him, it's in a vast network of the monastery. They wanna raise him and educate him and, and shower him and protect him and raise him right. And it's like, you lose one family, but you gain a village, you gain a monastery. And you, so in, in that way, it's an incredible benefit for the child it's an incredible benefit for the family because they feel like they are filling out their Dharma duty to give their child to, to the greater good of the community. None of this diminishes the loss. Of course, it's not like the, the, that child can't ever see their parents again. The Dalai Lama has all, always been in contact with his family, but it's like you lose close proximity with one, but you gain a bigger family. Now, are there cases where it doesn't go so well? Of course, I think there are, you know, you can't speak in generalities. I think there are cases, but we'd have to, we'd have to, I'm, I'm not gonna knock the tradition of it. Um, for example, with Tenzin Olsel, with the Spanish Lama boy uh, uh, reincarnation of Lama Yeshe, you know, Osel, who's a little younger than me, he didn't fit the mold. It didn't work the way it was supposed to in a way, you know, the way that it was traditionally, the parameters were traditionally defined. You know, his parents were very willing to, to, to give him up after this little Spanish boy did the tests and was recognized because they were dutiful devotees of Lama Yeshe, the predecessor. They, were, they had the receptivity and the, the cosmology uh, to give up their boy to the monastery, which he went and he did a traditional training, but at some point the seeds in him ripened and the mold didn't work for him. And he left the monastery and he left his position and he left in a way the, the state claim of the, the institution that was bequeathed to him that he was supposed to unfold within. And he followed his heart to become an artist and a, a drummer and a filmmaker and, and and live a lay life and have girlfriends. And now he's a father and slowly, slowly he's found his own way. And maybe eventually he will come back into the fold as a, as a teacher in his own right in, in the FPMT community. Um, but certainly we could use that as a case study of how sometimes this doesn't work the way it's supposed to, or, or maybe it won't work for Westerners as well, or who knows, but it's a very complicated thing. And I wouldn't want to be one to paint it in a very negative light with a broad brushstroke. I think, I think there's, of course, the human side of it, but then there's the deeper dharmic side of it, which I think is a very impressive institution to me. I think it has a lot of meta-narrative, uh, philosophical, metaphysical underpinnings that I, that I really value. I mean, it really it it places a human being in a greater context driven by the motivation of doing some service for the greater good. And that part of it, that's what underpins all of this stuff in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, so does it, does it 
does it neatly always um, manifest in that way? No, you know, there are bumps in the road and hiccups in the road. And certainly there is their fair share of challenges with these things. But overall, it's a, to me, it's a much more robust, loving meta narrative than the simply the reductionistic, consumeristic one that I was raised in. Mm -hmm. I can certainly see how a particular cultural or religious um, conditioning would make it so that a parent could give up their children at a young age. Certainly people raised in that context and even in fact Western converts, converts often more zealous than the uh, those born into the uh, the religious uh, view. And it, it, I think it's also been the case in Western civilization, there have been apprenticeship models where children have uh, young ages been sent away and so on. Fairly recent, perhaps, the psychological view of the of parental oversight being necessary. Um, it, you're absolutely right. It is a classic feature of any trial of uh, passage, or rites of passage. Uh, if you look at indigenous wisdom cultures, all, they most all follow a template of rites of passage in which the children are taken away from the parents. That is like, that is considered yeah. the, the pseudo death. For a period of time. For a period of yeah, time. Period of time. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite, I don't think it would be fair to say that rites of passage includes from three, four, five being taken away, really in, in many cases, never to return. Um, yeah. There is usually a sense of returning, but the, um, do you think that that cultural um, and religious uh, view shields the child from, from the effect of the, um, of the separation? It's always interesting to me. It seems to work well when it does work. But at the same time, we, we do hear lots of tulkus, especially more and more these days, uh, dissatisfied with their, to, <laughs> to use the American expression, dissatisfied with their experience. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, uh, yeah, yeah I'm maybe, just curious. It's interesting that from a therapeutic point of view, it's a big no-no. I think from the traditional point of view, it has its in, it has its internal rationale in that in that yeah. religious cultural view. Um, yeah. It's it's a sort of interesting to to, to to square those circles. I think especially as a sort of Buddhist psychotherapist, it's an interesting. I I, I would even say that you could visibly see that child miss his parents because that's natural and normal. I don't think it minimizes or shields them from that human. Uh, that human reaction or effect of being separated. Um, I think I've saw that visibly, you know, the, the affection, you know, the, the family of the little child was around. It's not like they were uh, never to be seen again. Um, but nevertheless, I think a child is a child and they want their parents and there's no, but I guess the, the point is, is that no parent can be universally available. And the child is going to feel either real abandonments or subtle abandonments. I think we call these micro traumas. Micro traumas are inevitably unavoidable. The question is not to avoid them. The question is what kind of container are they held within? And if it's a good container, then micro traumas can be uh, integrated, well integrated. And they can, they can form part of the identity structure, a much more robust, healthy identity structure. In other words, and this is, if we take it out of the context of the Tulku system and just look at anybody, as we were talking at the beginning of the, the, the chat, any trauma, you know, the little micro traumas of not getting the love that you want, the little traumas of being neglected, the little traumas of not having the emotional availability that make you feel insecure or inadequate or afraid or vulnerable, <clears throat> It, even amongst very well established, integrated, securely attached parents, these little traumas are inevitable. They're, they, they cannot be avoided. I mean, there's no, there's no template for perfect parenting. <laughs> I, I have to tell myself and remind myself all the time because I have a six-year-old and a thir thir three-year-old. And it's not me avoiding or trying to create an environment in which there are no hiccups and bumps and bruises. It's more important that the bumps and bruises and hiccups are held within a consistent womb or crucible or container or of attention. And, and, and that is more important because over time, what that does is it signals to the child that life is filled with bumps, but yet overall, 
you'll be held within them and you'll be able to learn to manage them. First, someone will help you manage them and eventually you'll be able to manage them. And actually then the traumas become allies. It's like Lojong, it's like uh, transforming adversity to the path because what it does is it ensures that you have the internal structures to ride through challenges in the future that you wouldn't have had you not had those bumps in the road that were held in that loving container. And that's what will make you a much more robust, dynamic and flexible human being. So you need those things. You don't, you definitely, I'm not making a case for overt traumas, big T traumas, like sexual abuse and these kinds. I'm talking about the more subtle developmental uh, small T traumas where it has to do with not getting enough of the things that we needed. Uh, they, if, if those are, if those are held within a kind of consistent framework of attention, they can end up being good resources. They create more tolerance in the end. They create more uh, deeper aptitude and receptivity and sensitivity and, and uh, flexibility. You know, they are the sources uh, for a more capable human being. So let's uh, return to your biography, shall we? Um, you went to <laughs> India. Well, let me it... ask you something before we do. What, what's the interest per se, or particularly in the Tulku system, or what, where did that question come from, may I ask? Yeah, it's, it came rather spontaneously to do with your discussion of your upbringing and its effects. Um, and you mentioned the uh, problems in Western society as you, as you expressed them, you know, or because we one maybe both parents are not there, maybe not even one parent is there. It's a single parent home. They're out working. Something like this. The child is is really by themselves. So it was your kind of referring to that um, that made me think. Oh, I wonder what about Tulkus? You know, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. you're talking about um, let me say the presence of a parent being essential for the healthy health of it, psychological health of a child. And in yeah. the Tulku system, of course, one thing that isn't there is the presence of the parent. Yeah. And um, if, if the Tulku is lucky enough to, it seems you're saying, to have a good um, tutor in a nurturing environment, then the, the trauma of that separation from the, uh, the damage you've won, of, of the, the lack of the parental uh, presence, it seems you're saying, can be mitigated to some degree and maybe even used to its advantage. Of course, the, uh, the justification, part, part of the justification for the Tulku uh, way it was done, less, less so is done these days, I think, was that that full immersion was necessary in order to uh, inculcate that child uh, thoroughly enough that they could hold that um, position yeah. of tulku. It really yeah. is, a, it, it seems to be uh, the tulku's function is, um, you know, many, they have many, many functions, but certainly a thorough kind of, a thorough shaping of the child seems to be necessary. Uh, like the Jesuits said, give me the boy and I'll give you the man. Yes. Yeah. And I, so I, I think that was put so beautifully and eloquently and, and I would agree with that. And I think we have nothing of the sort in our own traditions. <laughs> we do, we do, but it, it, much like the Tibetans in exile out of, out of their um, uh, situation, of course, that, that tradition is, is failing and prominent lamas like Zongjia Kenzi Rinpoche, for instance, criticized the Tulku system very severely. Mm. Um, and think it might actually need to be thrown out. Mm. People say that. We, um, so it seems that, that that tradition is fading as, as the contact of that culture with modernity unfolds. We certainly, it seems, in the Western tradition did have such situations, such apprenticeships, often from a young age, actually. We don't have it too much anymore. And certainly mm. modern, modern psychology would say, would, would be aghast at, at that sort of thing. Um, but through a lot of human history, Lots of the ways children were treated are now seen as, you know, quite a ghastly. I'm not saying what I agree with. I do, do I agree with psychology? Do I agree with the yeah. Tulku system? I'm not saying, I'm not coming down on one side or the other on the Tulku issue either, actually. I don't, you know, I'm just musing on it as a question. Mm. Yeah, this idea of give me the child and I'll give you the man, I think, you know, for, for all its possible negative trappings or, or results, uh, the loss of a, such a structure in our own societies where 
children are given mentorship and apprenticeship opportunity in order to flourish. I think we could really use some of that. I'm not talking about requiring the full on tulku system because that would, I'd agree with some so can say that just would never jive with our worldview as modern people. It, 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 will, it will be one of these very Tibetan things that I, that don't, doesn't translate. Even for um, the Tibetans. Even for the Tibetans as they become more modernized. I, I, I do, I do sort of agree with that. On the other hand, the, we do have to do something about the fact that we don't have containers for full development of our children. You know, ethically based, spiritually inclined with all its virtue and its worldview, places for the maturation and the unfoldment, including rites of passage and, and that help kids mature. That is not averse to challenge. Uh, because we've made our world and constructed a world that's very sanitized. And I don't think we're actually doing a service to children and their development. You know, everything is a squeeze bottle of, you know, sanitizing anything that could be perceived as dangerous or toxic. And I actually don't think that that sets them up for life. And, but, but then on the other hand, very thoughtful rites of passage and periods and challenges of isolation or periods of challenges uh, that would create the necessary causes of tumult in one's life, but held within a container and an under with a deeper understanding with enough support, let's say. I think that is that is definitely missing in our, I mean, we just put kids in front of a desk and ask them to sit for eight hours and there's not really much going on spiritually and internally for them. Uh, like I, I see my kid and I, we live in a part of Westchester out at, outside of New York City where there's a lot of woods and I, he's of the age now where I think another man who's, you know, uh, they call it rewilding here. Rewilding is bringing kids into the forest so they can learn different plants and how to navigate this and track and live more with cycle of nature and do archery and these kinds of things. It's he needs another man in his life to, to show him that kind of world and open him and challenge him and, and but be, pay attention to him. And it can't all fall to the nuclear family. And it can't be so sanitized that there's no challenge that serves as the sandpaper to rub up against for his growth. Uh, so personally, I would like more kind of those kinds of institutions in our, our apprenticeship. I mean, I, I, my mom currently lives in Greece and I have fantasies of him doing an apprenticeship with cabinetry because I believe that the, the world is changing so rapidly that I kind of don't want my kids growing up in front of a computer on the, some sort of corporate ladder structure. I'd much rather him be tactile and on the land and learn how to do something, make cabinets or build houses or learn how to do electrician, something, something, and of course, those old school, more considered blue collar, those, those were much more done with student apprentice, uh, master apprentice tradition. And there's something, there's something more that gets transmitted in those institutions than just the technical side of things. It's just the making of the cabinet. It's also close proximity. It's eye contact, vocal intonation, presence over time where someone's watching not only your technical proficiency develop, but seeing you as a human being develop. And we've kind of lost that. We, we don't have the patience for that. We don't, we don't really think that way anymore. It's like throw them into a cookie cookie cutter classroom of 40 people and now it's all online. I mean, we're getting further and further and further away from the intangibles of a human interaction that really spell to the soul that you're important and I'm invested in you. Speaking of which, you write here about uh, your mentors. I mentioned before in your book, Gradual Awakening, you write very fondly of them. You write a succession of instrumental relationships with luminaries, giants among teachers. With each successive mentor, I reached a new milestone in my process of maturity, standing on their shoulders, relying on their years of experience and building upon their accomplishments. I came to behold the horizon of infinite possibilities. I would have been too limited to see on my own. 
And you have indeed had many quite remarkable mentors. And I'd like to go through them, as I said before, uh, but before that, uh, good mentors are usually in high demand and quite, <laughs> and quite selective about who they invest in. If it gets out that someone's a good mentor, you know, of course, lots of demand. What are your qualities that make you such a, a good mentee to have attracted or to have fallen in with such remarkable mentors that you have? Yeah, I mean, I this is one thing I'm not uh, shy about. I, I have incredible uh, devotion and tenacity, forbearance. Uh, I, I am earnest, as earnest as it gets when it, come to, when it comes to my study, I, I don't let anything hold me back. I make no excuses. And when I, when I have an opportunity to study with someone like that, I will, I will take, it, take advantage fully of that opportunity. And I think all of my teachers saw that in me that I just, I was, I was going to be, I was not going to make any excuses and I was going to take full advantage of any moment with them. I had done my preparation. I had a good, sincere motivation. I was going to retain everything that they were going to tell me and I was going to try to apply it as best I can. And I, I don't think you can ask a, any more of a student than these kinds of things. I mean, I think the Lomrim is very clear about how not only to, to measure the acumen of your teacher, but also to self-reflect on the qualities that make for a good te uh, student. And, and, and this is one thing I'm not shy about. I, I'm, a, I'm a very good, diligent, uh, well-intended, uh, uh, earnest um, kind of person. And I think that very early on was recognized and that's why I was able to get access to some of these great, great people. Uh, but I did, I also put in my time, see, I wasn't just about um, extracting what I could from them. I, I helped build uh, whatever it was that their careers or their products or their services, I put in my time helping them, uh, you know, in their phase of life. Uh, and they, it was a reciprocity, you know, there's a reciprocal nature to the student and, uh, teacher relationship. Uh, I was willing to put in I was willing to give it my all to help someone further their career project or community or whatever it was. Um, and in exchange, this person was going to give me a healthy insider perspective and spend a little more time um, than, than is usual or common for them and, and give me a very profound download. Um, um, you know, at the time, I probably I probably got more than I gave, uh, but but now that I'm on the other side of things, and now I have my own students, I see, I can see the twinkle in some of their eyes. Those that are that 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 were a little like me, and of course, that's as the teacher now. I feel that that's the most attractive thing is who who's willing to just go to the end of the line to do it. Who's willing to bear unbelievable challenges to get the teaching and who's willing to spend the extra time and who's willing to make the sacrifice and who's willing to put it into practice and who's willing to really integrate this stuff. That's whom I want to invest in. And once I recognize that in someone, I will go, I will give and give and give. I will not stop uh, because that's, that's what excites me. That's where my passion and vitality comes from. And it is, it is, it's like, it's like a, uh, it's like a current. Uh, it feeds on its, itself, you know, when you find that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And a significant, uh, one of those very significant mentors for you and uh, a huge influence on your professional and personal life, it seems, was Dr. Joseph Loizzo, a contemplative psychotherapist, clinical researcher and Buddhist scholar teacher. And you write about him Joe became a new parent to my inner child, so I could disidentify from my damaged self-view and embrace new qualities of self-love and confidence. I owe him my life. And then you go on to write, and I think this um, illustrates some of what you were saying. When I first met Joe, I was in my early 20s and had come back from my second pilgrimage in India. I had a meditative breakthrough with Godwin in the Garden of Eden, but didn't have a professional career path yet those references to Godfrey and Garden of Eden. You'll have to read the book to find out about that. Very interesting. And I was a little <laughs> lost in that regard. Seeing both desperation and hunger in my eyes, Joe graciously offered me an internship. I got up and busted my ass to get into the city, which was several hours round trip with a few bucks in my pocket. 
I got Joe T, set up his teaching space, fetched his patient folders, and prepped the meditation tapes for his clients. I ran around doing whatever he needed so I could sit in his office for an hour and study how a master therapist works. I did that for 15 years. And those experiences far exceeded anything I learned during my expensive three-year degree, academic education. And in a way, my apprenticeship with Joe hasn't stopped. It will never stop. He'll always be my mentor and the learning never ends. The only reason I'm writing and sharing this book now is because I got some good downloading time with that guy and other evolved mentors like him. It's a wonderful tribute to him. And how did you meet Joe uh, Loizzo? And can you elaborate a little bit on the details of your study with him, what you learned, uh, those intangibles that you're talking about? Maybe you can make some of them a little tangible for us. And, and can you also talk maybe a little bit about that parental role uh, that you describe? Yeah, so I met, I met Joe because I was in India for my second stint and I was coming up on a decision tree where I was either going to become a monastic or uh, turn to the world and become a professional. And of course, the monastic thing never really panned out for me. And so I got into a master's program at NYU and uh, where I was able to synthesize my interest uh, in Tibetan Buddhism and psychotherapy. And, but I needed a mentor to guide the study. And at the time there was one particular fellow who dominated the, the field of Buddhist psychology and that was Mark Epstein. He still is considered the, you know, one of the founding sort of fathers of Buddhist psychotherapy. He's a well-published author and sort of very was very seminal in my early years, his writings and readings. So I reached out to him to see if he would guide my study and he wasn't available, but he did recommend one other, one other chap up at uh, Columbia University. He said, go see uh, Joe. He's, you know, he, 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 he does what I do, but uh, maybe more available. And I'll never forget the first day that I met Joe. You know, I had written him with my interest and my predicament coming from India, studying mindfulness, uh, wanting to integrate my program uh, with, with integrate with psychotherapy for my program. He said, "Come up and see me." And I remember walking into his office up there at Columbia and uh, sitting down with him. And uh, he had his classic black beret on, and we were in the uh, medical we were in the medical center, and uh, and he looked at me and he said, "What can I do for you?" You know, he had seen, seen my resume and he had seen my uh, email and, and there was just this uh, quality of I'm here for you. Between the lines, it was like, I've been waiting for you. We can do anything that you want. And he never said that, but that was the energy. It's like, I'm, I'm here for you. We can go on whatever ride you want. We can do whatever you want to do. And that is a very powerful endorsement for someone who has never felt adequate in the eyes of anyone their entire life. And so, I mean, Joe was the most, one of the most genius integrators of Tibetan Buddhism and psychology and neuroscience I've ever, ever known. He's not that well known on the public stage, but and he is a, he's a giant. And I have always had admiration for his intellect and his synthesis. He has created a whole language that not only preserves Tibetan Buddhism, but brings it, updates it into a contemporary context and uh, that is so elegant and so refined uh, that I think there are few on the planet that are like him. Uh, but the most important thing that I learned from Joe wasn't necessarily the technology and the techniques and the language and the prescriptions. The education was really about confidence building. And it, it took a long time. I spent 20 years with Joe. 20 years is a long time. I mean, I, I look at people who are young now, I don't think they're ready to invest 20 years in anything. They want instant success. They want to be a guru. They want to have the greatest uh, following. They want to publish a book. Uh, they want to do things on the fly before they've had any time to steep in the tea. And uh, Joe's careful, methodical presence, guidance, supervision, exposure to how therapy works, exposure more importantly to the mind of the therapist, exposure to the nervous system of the, of the therapist. And then more importantly, Joe brought me into his life. I was there for his wedding. 
he ended up marrying my wife and I in a closed ceremony in our own house while my father was dying and was online. He was coming through, being patched through Skype online uh, from Turkey while Joe married us in a Vajrayana ceremony in, in, you know, barefoot in my own house. And I spent time with his kids. He spent time with my kids. We built Nalanda Institute together. It was a profound relationship a uh, multi-textured, you know, multi-layered, it went well beyond career supervision and being a good therapist. It went into the world of love. I mean, it was love, investment of love, care, interest. And he wanted the best for me. And he didn't, he wasn't there just to tutor me to be a good psychologist. He wanted me to be a good human being. He wanted me to fulfill my potential. And that, I mean, that's just so rare. It's so, it's such a unique opportunity. I look back and I think I mean, this is, you can't buy experiences like that. And I know that I've never, I've never bat an eyelash without gratitude for that kind of experience. Uh, but that's what made it so profound. That's why uh, the trauma work is so much clearer to me now because I have had the experience of the intangible ingredients that go into trauma work. Successful trauma treatment is contingent upon safety and consistency and reliability and vulnerability and trust repair and attention these things you don't get in an academic seminar. You don't get them in school. You don't get them. You, they're not available on the market. And uh, that kind of access, it was vital. It was vital. And but what, what the main take home for me now on the other side of it, you know, because we also have to go through the fact that I left Joe. I left him. And they never train you. They always say when the student is ready, they say what? The teacher appears. But they never say when the student is ready, the student becomes the teacher, which means you leave your teacher. And no one, no one writes about that. And in my case, I took that relationship to its apex and its zenith. And there came a point where holding on to the relationship was actually a detriment rather than a further blessing. In other words, the plant pot or the crucible or the container in which I was slowly brought out of the deep thaw of paralysis of my own trauma and given the nutrients of light and soil and water to flourish, the container itself, I outgrew it. And I had to say goodbye. I had to walk away. I had to let it go uh, because it, it was only, it was only, it, it served a, for, a certain purpose, that relationship. And that purpose had been fulfilled. My confidence, which was devastated and crushed by my father, came of age with my relationship with Joe. I, I could teach in my own right. I could give therapy with confidence. But more importantly, I felt myself to be worthy of doing these kinds of things, which I had never previously felt. And I wasn't walking around the planet forever feeling like I was an impingement on, on people, but I actually had something to offer them. Uh, but without the hubris, uh, a blend of humility, but also confidence or dignity as Patrick Rinpoche would say, I found dignity with Joe. And it took 20 years. I mean, you know, I don't know what to say about that. We could do a whole podcast on what it really takes. Um, but at the end of it, you know, the time came and probably I overextended. I was too afraid to let go of him. I probably didn't read the, the writing on the wall. We never really had a frank conversation about the end of the journey. And actually, you know, the Buddha has this story about the Dharma being a raft. Have you ever, you've heard that one, right? The Dharma is a raft, it helps you get to the other shore. But then once you get to the other shore, you don't carry the raft around, you let the raft go. It served its function to, to deliver you. And the guru, student mentor student relationship served its function i had found my dignity i had had my own career i had learned how to build a community i had learned how to be a therapist um i had my own students it was no longer 
it was no longer making sense for me to remain in that position as his assistant. And uh, it was an unfortunate rupture that we had between each of us, you know, uh, uh, but in, in another way, I conceive of it as if it not were for this rupture, maybe I would have just prolonged the dependency. And so it just took something unfortunate for us to really recognize that the time is up. You know, we really didn't have that frank conversation that I think now I do have with my students as a result of this learning is like, I'll take you to a certain place, but then you take yourself beyond and you have to go beyond and you have to go do your own life. And maybe we won't be in relationship anymore, or maybe we'll be in another kind of relationship, but it won't be this one because this one served a purpose that has now been fulfilled. When did that rupture occur? And, and what was the um, anatomy of that rupture? Uh, it, it occurred in 2018. And, um, I would, sit, I would just say it was a near death experience uh, because basically Joe was everything to me. He, he revived me, he gave me new life, he brought me up, he brought me up from a young child to a, a decent functioning human being, he gave me my start, he gave me my training, he gave me everything. Uh, it was a success, it was a complete success. And then there was a particular event where something just sort of shattered, it just sort of shattered, which I won't go into detail about, but the, the most important learning lesson for people listening right now is that some of these so-called earth shattering near death experiences from the Tibetan perspective are transitions. And from the hero's journey arch 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 archetype, you have to die in order to be reborn. You have to die and slay a demon before you find treasure. Everybody wants the treasure, no one wants to die. No one wants to go into the labyrinth. No one wants to leave home. No one wants to leave the familiar. Uh, 20 years creates a lot of muscle memory. We were swimming along fine with a successful institute, him as the director, me as the assistant director, building wonderful training programs, etc. That all came to a very shattering halt one night. And for me, what it did was it, it was a, a, a deep dagger to the heart, a deep, deep dagger to the heart that just shattered everything for me. I mean, I felt my body give out. And just like 20 years of rehabilitation from the wounds of my father, it also took several years for me to recover from Joe. Um, but really, what, what is it that I'm recovering from? It's not the external figure. It's not the external figure. Tra trauma, trauma, people think, oh, I get over my trauma, I rehabilitate my trauma. But trauma is a, is a very insidious bedfellow. And things that you think you have dealt with, unbeknownst to you, certain catalytic events can re-aggravate them. And you just learn that you have a little bit more to do. And in this situation with Joe, I learned that there was a part of me that was still living out the dependency on my father, even though he was a better father. And even though he loved me unconditionally, I was still too afraid to make my own life. I needed him. And this strike to the heart, what it did is it, is it cast me away from Joe. It was our final, we needed to have a final break and I remember there was shortly after I took my students on pilgrimage to Nepal. And there I was reunited with Geshe Tenzin Zopa, my current teacher. And one could say that I would easily just transfer my dependency from one guru to another Lama. But something inside of me awoke to the fact that I would continue to have relationships with mentor figures, but I wouldn't never have them in the same way. And what I mean by that is that kind of sense of hierarchy and that sense of I'm the student, you're the teacher, and that sense of I'm deficient and you have the resource, that sense of I, I still lack something and you have it. 
that changed. When I left Joe and took Geshe Tenzin Zilpa as my main guru, it wasn't from a sense of deficiency. It was if I'm I'm all I'm already full. I'm already okay. I'm already healed. I I could easily listen to him as my teacher and I could easily turn it around and teach him something. And that's a different kind of way of relating to the Lama. And I think a lot of people rush into the guru-student relationship unbeknownst to them or unaware of the more deep-seated traumatic level of the psyche and the power differential and the inadequacy and the shadow and the spiritual bypass and all of that stuff. And that didn't happen with me because I put in the time and went full a full 20 years integrating myself and now I still hold on to the institution of having a teacher, but I don't do it from a blind spot of feeling unworthy. And depending on the context, I could be peers with Geshe Tenzin Zopo. And, you know, for some people out there, that's going to be considered hubris. Uh, they're going to see that as a stroke of arrogance. Uh, but I, I am who I am and I feel what I feel and I don't feel subservient. I don't feel less than anymore. Now, will I put my head on Geshe Tenzin Zopa's feet and prostrate myself fully? Of course I will do that. Of course I will do that. And I will do it with the most sincere devotion and I am amazed by him. But I'm no longer amazed by him with the secret fantasy that there's something he has that I don't have anymore. And that's the difference. And that's, that is the treasure that was discovered on the heels of this rupture with Joe. And I remember physically, there was a one point in, in the pilgrimage in Nepal where I was surrounded by 30 of my students. I took 30 of my students on pilgrimage. We went to, we went to have pilgrimage with Geshe Tenzin Zopa and Geshe Tenzin Zopa set up a book launch for Gradual Awakening, the book that you're, you're sharing quotes from. We had a book launch with 700 nuns at Kopan Nunnery. And the day before, or the day of, I remember being with my students and I just had a vision. I had a vision of them carrying my dead body over a threshold from one world to the next and delivering me to the monastery or to the nunnery. Like I remember seeing my dead body floating and they were, they were holding me up and passing me along in a long line from one world where I had died and my heart was broken and I had cut all, severed all ties and I was being delivered to the nunnery. And there Geshe Tenzin Zopa made a place on the, on, the, on the throne for me, next to him. Not above him, not below him, next to him. And it's a very symbolic moment of arriving in a greater sense of dignity and, see, and allowing myself to be seen as a teacher, not as a shameful teacher, not as a half-baked teacher, not as a whatever, but amongst my own peers, it was like a coronation or a validation. Is is in 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 tantric tradition, there are so many psychodramas enacted through ritual that have this the purpose of allowing yourself to feel anointed. That that is important because in Tantra, what you're doing is you are remembering that you are a Buddha. And you can't fully have divine pride and pure view if you still have this cross-contamination of confusion about your worth and your dignity, right? It, it, they don't go together. They mix like oil and water. It's like in your ordinary state, you feel shameful. But then when you're practicing Tantra and you're visualizing yourself as a, as a, as a deity, you feel powerful and capable and confident. Uh, but it doesn't really work that way. And, and that, that vision and those rituals are about suggesting to the deepest part of your mind, no, you're not this shameful person. No, you're not this broken person. No, you're not this wounded person. You are your Lama. You are the Lama. You are the deity. That's who you are. 
And it takes time to mature from that as a concept to that as an energetic felt sense for the intuition and the conception to meet in an embodied felt sense. And that's what happened that day. There was this crossing over and this coronation amongst my, my, my peers where I, I, I finally felt like a uh, phoenix rising from this broken brokenness. And that took a year and then a bit more time to recover a bit more than after the year. But that, I have to say that for those of people that are working through their trauma, when you have these kinds of experiences and you look back on them, you would have it no other way. Even though it destroys you, when you see it from the vantage point of having made your way through it and integrating it and seeing what its purpose was, you would never undo it. You would never undo the great sacrifice. You would never undo the, the heart-wrenching destruction. You would never undo the death. You would never undo the betrayal. You would never undo the broken trust because it, it is out of that fire that you are forged and you are made and your dignity was found. And so in my case, that's how I look back on it now. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you for your candor. In his um, endorsement of your book, Geshe Tenzin Zopa writes, Dr. Miles Neal is a learned teacher and psychologist who has devoted himself to scientific and Buddhist philosophical training for the past 20 years, and whose life is a living example of the Bodhisattva conduct that the Lamrim teachings were intended to manifest in all of us. Another significant influence on you has been uh, Professor Robert Thurman, the former J. Tsongkhapa Professor of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist Studies at Columbia, very famous academic and writer on Buddhism. You write about him, I volunteered to fold chairs and collect coats at Tibet has in exchange for access to Thurman's teachings, which were a fusion of enlightened wrath and creative articulation. I savored his words from the shadows of the last row of the room for two decades, as my confidence grew and I became a faculty member at Tibet House. I now take the stage to teach with the teachers I admired from afar, thus fulfilling the true intent of the Lam Rim and the hero's journey, to become a mentor oneself and to bestow on others the life-affirming message and skills that Joe Loizzo, Bob Thurman, and through him His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and the entire Galupa lineage of the Dalai Lamas imparted to me. I'm curious how you met Professor Thurman and what, how, what are the specifics of his influence on you? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, this is the Western version of the Parampara. The Parampara is the lineage, okay? The, the, the Dalai Lama, you know, a young Bob Thurman in his early 20s meets the Dalai Lama and becomes the first Westerner to ever ordain as a Tibetan Buddhist monastic and becomes one of the first endowed chairs and professors of Tibetan Buddhist studies uh, in the United States. And so, you know, he, we would call Bob Thurman, I, I call, he's the grandfather of Buddhism in the West. You know? <laughs> and when Joe was 20, he walked into a college, freshman college seminar where he met Bob Thurman as the teacher who was 10 years or older, 30 years old, Bob was teaching his seminar just fresh from coming from Dharamsala. And that's where Joe met his teacher at 20. And I met Joe when I was 20. So that's how the lineage goes. It comes right from the nectar of his holiness through the first Tibetan uh, Westerner to be ordained, through Joe, who I consider the first to really do a thorough and complete synthesis of Tibetan Buddhism with neuroscience and down to me. And so it's something, I mean, I'm traditional in this way. I feel that that is very important. It gives uh, a sense of vitality and authenticity and genuineness and sincerity, sincerity uh, to the transmission. Uh, does, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make me you know, better, pure, whatever. It just, for me in my own mind, it provides a sense of competence and confidence to know that I'm aligned with that transmission that I'm not making things up, that I've been, I've put in my time with a, with a good source. Um, so, you know, when, when I had met Joe early on and it took him as my main mentor, I was still at NYU, as I mentioned, and was doing my, my independent study. And he actually suggested that I also go to Tibet House and get 
the direct source. You know, it's like, why don't you go study with my teacher while you're doing this? I'll teach you the clinical aspect and you go downtown to Tibet House and study with my teacher and get it from the, you know, the horse's mouth, so to speak. And so I did that. I went down to Tibet House and I would, you know, do whatever I can to follow. I didn't have a nickel to my name at the time. And I was living in an expensive city. Like, and I would just, anytime Bob was thinking, sort of speaking, I was there. And I, whatever what I had to do to get access, whether it be clean up, sweep up, you know, greet people, whatever I did, I just did it because, and, and one thing about Bob is he's a lot, he has the Buddha's lion roar. I mean, he is, first of all, he's a character. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a genius, but his eloquence, his art, especially when he was in his prime, he just, he knew how to use language to make a visceral impact on people and to make synaptic connections between things and to really impart knowledge so that you felt it in your body. A captivating speaker, a lion, like roaring, oh, just, a, just a Dharma lion. He's a huge man, by the way, and he's got one eye and he's just, he's a, he's, he's like a trickster type archetype. It just mixes up, shatters you, pushes you, moves you. Uh, he's just, just an incredible, incredible teacher. I, you know, all the kinds of artistic impressions of teaching and Bob Thurman has got to be one of my favorites, one of my favorites. And I just devoured, and of course, Bob was teaching in a time where they started archiving his lectures. And, and so I had access to the Bob Thurman archive, which meant that like in every spare moment of my training, I was listening to Bob and then studying with Joe, like watching Joe by night work with patients. And then by day, just pipelining Dharma indirectly from Bob Thurman. And then I would go on retreats, for example, and I would do visualizations. And I was trying to visualize all the traditional Tibetan lineage tree, for example. But in my visualization tree, the people that I saw were Bob and Joe, because I had just had this direct, I mean, I could see Joe with his green, his, his black beret, and I could see Bob with his one gnarly eye. And like, they were, in my, they were in my jewel tree, yeah. And I was having a download transmission through the Dalai Lama through them. And that's... Mm -hmm. So what kind of impact did Bob Thurman have? I mean, he just was so inspiring a figure. I mean, he made he made learning Buddhism fun. And, and you know, the one thing I caught Bob Thurman at a time where he, oh, Tibet House, by the way, is like Bob Thurman's public teaching venue. And that's significant because I didn't ever like, unlike Joe who learned Tibetan and studied in a Buddhist studies program, PhD with, at Columbia with Bob. I got Bob in his more casual teaching guys. In other words, while he was at Tibet House, he could really let go. He wasn't encumbered by the religious academic uh, performance, uh, rigid constriction of academic performance. Like at Columbia, you can't really teach meditation. You can't really, uh, maybe you can now, but at the time it was like, you know, for Bob to be fully free and unencumbered, he had to go and teach at Tibet House and really could, you know, go into the Bardo Tadol. He could go into visualization. He could lead people through an intensive visualization on the death process. He could do all these things that in an unconstrained way. And that's the kind of access that I got to him. And you, you either love him or you hate him. He just is such a remarkable, makes an, an impor, a remarkable impression. And uh, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, I was very, very fortunate to have both Joe and Bob. They really served these kind of two tutorial positions. They they were really my, my clinical mentor and one that worked most closely with me. And I never had that fully close up immersive experience with Bob, but he knows who I am and he knows how earnest I am. And he has been so, so, you know, recently, I, because now I have my own program, I asked Bob to come and even though he's got such a busy schedule, he agreed and he gave us a wonderful, wonderful download on emptiness. And, and, and in that moment, I, I, my, my early interest and passion and enthusiasm for, for Bob was rekindled because he was so spontaneous. I mean, he could just go, on a complete joyride for your mind, and he could really transport you. And that is one of the one of the profound uh, characteristics, or features, or hallmarks of a good teacher is that they can just move you. They can take you places with your imagination. And Bob Bob was one of the best at doing that. 
That's very fascinating. You haven't always had uh, such stellar luck with your mentors. Around the time you met Professor Thurman, you also met Geshe Michael Roach. And you say, you write about him. I was attracted to Roach's scholarly depth, the devotion and sincerity of this community and how both he and his students were so fiercely dedicated to the pursuit of enlightenment. Roach's determination and encouragement to reach spiritual realization was in stark contrast to the message of many other Western Buddhist teachers who tended to underplay and minimize the goal as a real possibility. I've always been a seeker at heart, ready to set my worldly house ablaze to find an ultimate solution to my and our human problems. And in Roach, I thought I'd found someone who shared my yearning and conviction. While I did not become his devotee and gulp the Kool-Aid he proffered, I did sip it until I realized something was off. And you write a little later in that chapter, allegations of sex, lies, manipulation, brainwashing, ritualistic violence, abuse of power, and the eventual death of a student followed and exposed Roach's human vulnerability, branded his community a cult, and mired his legacy in scandal. Can you talk a little bit about meeting uh, Geshe Michael Roach, what you studied with him, and how you began to perceive something was off? I'm also interested in the consequence of that relationship for you. Yeah, I was never a direct student of him, but Michael Roach used to come into New York City with, at the time, his consort and give teachings both on Bhagavad Gita and Tibetan Lamrim, things that I was very interested in. And he definitely is a very charismatic leader. There is something otherworldly about his eloquence also. Um, I did a few of his courses and I ended up going to a retreat or two with one of his teacher or with one of his senior teachers, with one of his senior students who was a teacher. And I was, you know, the, the community that Geshe Michael Roach con c created is really one of very, very earnest uh, students. And there's something infectious and very attractive about that. These are, these are, they, it really felt very passionate people that were really willing, like I was, to make huge sacrifices in order to really, you know, they weren't confused about the value of Dharma and they weren't confused about what they would sacrifice in order to live fully Dharmic lives. So that was very attractive. On the other hand, you know, when the scandal broke out, I was a therapist in full practice at that time. And I started getting phone calls of people who were very deeply wounded that were looking for psychological help, but from someone who really understood the worldview out of which they were coming from. So my biggest, I'm not here to lamb blast Michael Roach. I mean, I think that he's been involved in some things that from the traditional point of view, but people like Bob Thurman and Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who I, I, had, I consider my main teachers, they called him out on and he, you know, has to defend himself against their allegation. But for me, the, the most important aspect of this part of my journey was just how damaging a distorted worldview can really be for young minds and for impressionable minds that are softened by devotion. When you take a teacher and you take their worldview, particularly the the thing about Geshe Michael Roach was his teaching on karma was very, very corruptive. His teaching on karma, and still probably is, is something, some sort of bastardized mix between the law of attraction and some, that essentially makes one believe that everything in the world comes from one's mind. In other words, you're responsible for absolutely everything that happens. Even the bad things that happen to you are your fault. And it's too, too often uh, taken as a kind of blame the victim stance. And so we have this very, very damaging mix of devotion to this larger than life charismatic figure and receptivity towards them. But then also this message that you're, you're liable and at fault for all the wrongs of the world. And if very, sensitive, decent human beings under there that haven't done a lot of work on their shadow can easily fall into the trap of replicating traumatic habits and patterns of I'm a bad person and what do I have to do to repent and reveal my, uh, repeat and repent and, um, and uh, atone myself. 
And so when you have tantric institutions like Samaya or the, the vows and commitments that you have to your, to your devoted Lama, that suggests that all the negativities that you see in the world are a result of your impure view and that you should continue to uh, purify your own karma. What that does is it leaves open the possibility of uh, the teacher themselves avoiding any responsibility or liability whatsoever. And I think that that's what's happened with that lineage and that community. And maybe that happened with Sogyal, I'm not sure, but there's a sense that when you're, when you take a Vajra teacher and you take the vow of pure view and you take the vow of sama, keeping your vows or Samaya with the guru, uh, that anything that they do that would ordinarily be considered outrageous, like sexual assault or, or something, becomes your fault. Like you have to do more practice. You're not seeing the lesson that's revealing itself here. And that is, as a therapist, I became very interested in that because that's a classic spiritual bypass. I mean, that is, that is where the world of trauma and Buddhism are most perversive, perversely intersecting. Uh, because now you have a worldview in which you have condemned yourself to be a sinner without, without the ability to repair and have left everybody off the hook for their own uh, little section of responsibility. And so I really took it upon myself to look, start, start looking very, very carefully at the teachings on karma and to see how they had kind of been co-opted or bastardized or taken out of reference or overgeneralized or overblown or in a way not made, made skillful. And this is not, this is, this is my kind of cultural pushback because it's not just Geshe Michael Roach. There's a lot, there's a large, there's a large sort of cultural uh, traditional presentation of karma that is easily misunderstood to be this way. Whereas I, I see karma to mean more a psychological, taking responsibility for your own psychology, but not taking responsibility for events, for example. When, when you are abused by someone, that's not your fault. That's not your karma. Any more than it is the, you are responsible for the weather. In other words, weather has its own source of causality. It's not that we're saying weather has no causality at all. It has its own, but it's not, it's not caused by your mind, the weather. Uh, and nor is it when someone abuses you or, or sexually molests you, is it your fault? Now, how you end up interpreting and working with that person and how you relate and respond to that circumstance, that is your responsibility. You can't just be a completely passive victim to circumstance. You have to take some responsibility. And so as the Me Too movement shows, that responsibility can look like ferocity and saying, setting a boundary and saying, this is absolutely inexcusable. And that is karma. That is the exhibition on, uh, of somebody's, that, that is the expression of someone's karmic will to set up a boundary and say no. And that's what I think happened both in Geshe Michael Roach's community. There was a big fragmentation, a big movement for some of the students to come forward and say no to this behavior as there was in the Rigpa uh, scenario with Sogyal Rinpoche before he died where eight students you know, basically came forward and said no, uh, we won't tolerate this kind of egregious uh, conduct that flies in the face of basic morality and ethical precepts, no matter what. We're not confused and we're not deluded and we're not going to fall for that Samaya bullshit. And the, you know, but the, the whole discussion goes on and on because there's people from both sides and it's a very complex thing. But I, uh, in a way, I'm very clear where I stand. I don't care what level of realization you're working on. If you are sexually inappropriate with your student, if you if you take their money and you and use it in ways that wasn't discussed, if you do anything that breaches your ethical precept, you're at fault. It's not the student's bloody fault, and that's that's not uh, universally held within the Dharma communities. And but uh, but I'm not I, I don't I'm not afraid to put that particular stance out there. But that, that was the big lesson that I learned from Geshe Michael Roach is that uh, scandals are, there is no shortage of scandals with Tibetan Buddhism and yoga in the Western world. The, the reason that there are scandals is not just maniacal or narcissistic leaders. The reason that there's also scandals is that there are also a shadow of unprocessed trauma in the living minds of students that get 
obscurated and activated and and it and it is really really important in my point of view that students undergo their own analysis and their own therapy and become familiar with trauma and become familiar with spiritual bypassing and get a good hold on their dynamics with their teacher so that they can actually use the teaching instruction institution wisely and maturely to their advantage and not let it or try to avoid letting it become a, um, a complete toxic mess. And so, for example, in my own community, in my own programming, when I teach Dharma, I often very early in the curriculum have classes in trauma and have classes in spiritual bypassing and have classes in uh, Jungian depth psychology to, to really sufficiently equip people who are studying and training meditative arts and, and Dharma wisdom uh, to, be, to be able to recognize the tell, telltale signs of their own, uh, their own uh, wounding and, and to give and to empower them into a healthy set of boundaries and an ability to communicate and navigate this very precious and but yet delicate uh, relationship with the spiritual teacher. Not that I position myself as a spiritual teacher. That's another thing I want to make very clear. I'm not the guru in my community. I'm considered a senior student. And we bring in Geshe Tenzin Zopa as the guru figure in my community. And I basically work with my students as a kind of senior peer of theirs. And uh, uh, but nevertheless, I still teach them and I want them to learn not only Dharma, but side by side with Dharma, some of the mo more uh, important tools and skills that come out of contemporary studies. It's fascinating. Um, I'm aware of the time. Yes. Uh, we've been going for a couple of hours. Uh, yeah, you've got a lot of energy. Thank you so much for having me on such a, uh, I guess we could go on and on and on, but thank you for hanging out with me for such a long period of time. You have stamina is what I was going was trying to say. You, you must have that, uh, you must have your, uh, your, your spiritual practice must include the energetic body or the Vajra body because you, have, you haven't even blinked an eyelash since I've been on this, yapping away with you on this podcast. Isn't, uh, isn't no blinking a sign, a sign of uh, trauma response? <laughs> Maybe, maybe, it's, it's, maybe it's not my uh, illusory body practice. Maybe it's uh, some <laughs> profound uh, undiscovered trauma. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been an absolute pleasure, Steve. And I, I do have to say, once again, as I did at the top, I've enjoyed your critical reflection, your eloquence, your, uh, your, your engaging uh, uh, questions. I really feel from you, although I very much uh, appreciate just meeting you, but I feel from you, you have that wonderful sincerity. You're really a seeker of truth and your podcast is so, so impeccable. So I just want to thank you. I feel honored to have, be on your show and to continue to really listen to you on your podcast. I, I really wish for you that you, uh, you, you uh, really reach so many people who really are in this kind of niche, really sincere people who want to have access with all these great people that you have on your podcast, so Ian Baker and Glenn Mullen and Dr. Nita, and the list goes on and on and on. But you, of course, set it up in such a wonderful way to really uh, access what their wisdom is. And so I really honor you and appreciate you for that endeavor. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for your kind words, Miles. And thank you for uh, being so candid and being so generous with your time. Uh, it's been wonderful having you on. Dr. Miles Neal, thank you very much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.